Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another special edition of the show. I got to come up to Austin. Let me tell you, anytime I can come to Austin for business, because this is technically business, I, I will. Um, I've got Bill Elsey here, and I did say it right, correct? Yeah. LC. Okay. Yep. Elsey. Okay. Um, uh, he's here with, uh, we're at Red Room Lounge. Yeah. And uh, he contacted me, invited me to come up here to hang out with him a little bit, and uh, we've been sharing some bubbly. And uh, we're going to talk about everything associated with him, Red Room Lounge, we'll do some tasting. Um, but uh, uh, let's go and get started. So Bill, tell us a little about yourself, who you are, and how you got into the business. All right, so um, like I said, my name's uh, Bill Elsie. I am uh, sommelier and general manager here at the Red Room Lounge in uh, downtown Austin, Texas, which is a pretty casual, laid back uh, spot that is underground. So we're in a basement um, in an old building um, on Third Street. Really, we seat about 50 people. Um, have a pretty nice selection of wines, carry about 400 or so different wines, and we just really wanted to create a place that was conducive to all things wine drinking and relaxation. We felt like, like a lot of the favorite places in town for me uh, to drink at were at restaurants, but they didn't, you know, they close at nine or at 10 or 11 yeah. or so. And so we wanted to have a place that was kind of a, you know, late night spot, so stay open a little bit later. And uh, all I do here is wine. And so we um, opened about 10 months ago and, you know, had some fun with it ever since then. So just try to keep, uh, keep wine, you know, being fun. But I've been in and out for about, uh, about seven years. Got into the industry right out of college. I uh, didn't know much about wine at all, took a weekend job working at a, uh, a local uh, Hill Country winery. Um, at the time it was Mandola State Winery, mm -hmm. now it's Dukeman Family Winery. And um, so, yeah, just working Saturdays and Sundays for a couple of hours and really after about three months sparked my interest in wine. It was like, wow, this is a, a whole world that I didn't know anything about. People were using all these descriptors about the wines and talking about wineries that I'd never even heard of. and. Um, and I thought it was fascinating and people that came and visited us and that I, that I dealt with were you know They were always just uh, Just looking to have a good time and I really like picked up the culture of it and just kind of liked it So I got involved with, um, with some of the winemaking there uh, I got involved helping out with some of the uh, you know the vineyard management stuff a little bit helping out with uh, harvest and um, We ended up opening up a restaurant next door um, after about a year and that's where I got my real introduction into the world of what it's like to sell a lot of wine, buy a lot of wine, things like that. So at uh, the whopping age of 24, they gave me the keys and um, I was super green with it and really kind of, they, they let me figure it out. Um, but then I, I kind of had the realization that, you know, if I'm going to be spending hundreds of thousands, probably about a million dollars um, in wine a year, I better know, you know, what I'm talking about. and. Uh, so I, then I got involved um, with the the Court of Master Sommeliers. Um, did the um, or met a, a Master Sommelier named uh, Greg Harrington. Um, also met a Master Sommelier named Guy Stout uh, here in Texas. It's and awesome, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> like two two great guys, and they were like, okay, you need to you need to do the intro. This is how this thing works. So I went into the introductory exam. Um, we had it here in in Austin. This was back in like oh eight, yeah, oh eight, and I thought, okay. I buy wine for a restaurant. I've been in the industry now for two years. Like, I got this. This is good. Like, I know Italian wines. I know some California stuff. And had my mind blown during the intro exam. And I actually didn't think that I passed. I was r very concerned about it because I was somewhat specialized. And with the court or any type of wine education, you got to know everything, really. It forces you to know everything. So I was, uh, I was amazed at the, the knowledge um, that the masters had. And after that day, I told myself, like, if this is what I want to do, and which it reaffirmed that that's what I wanted to do, um, I had better not ever go into an exam that woefully underprepared again. So it was great in that sense. So I ended up passing it, um, really kind of hunkered down, um, 
passed my certified exam in 2009. Um, did some other stuff along the way. Got my certified special spirits, certified specialist wine, CWE, and then um, was. Uh, fortunate enough to uh, win the Texas Best Sommelier competition in 2011, which kind of catapulted my, my career and then um, used the next year after that to really buckle down and study for the advanced um, exam through the court. So back in August of 2012, um, was flew out to DC, did the whole week test and thankfully got uh, got the pass one of one of 10 of us in the class um, on the first attempt so got a little bit of a lull now with testing if you will but um, you know hoping to sit the master exam uh, you know get the invite here relatively soon right and uh, and see where it goes and so in the interim you know open up the spot and um, trying to have some fun with wine and you know enjoying uh, being a sommelier in Austin Texas so nice. kind of a kind of a whirlwind seven years I guess in the short yeah right there. Um, so something we're talking you're talking about you're waiting for the invite mm -hmm. for for the master so this is not something that okay I, I got my advanced and now I can check that off and now I can just put now I can just do it they're, they're they kind of really want yeah. They don't want just anybody taking. Well, not that they want, but they, they want to make sure. I guess you're ready for it. Is that I, what it is? I, that's definitely part of it. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, a deal where you need to stay somewhat relevant in either wine competitions or um, just different things. I think with tasting with with masters and things like that. So they want to see a level of preparedness exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, the court has become the body for uh, sommelier certification and I say has become they have been for a while but now there's so many more candidates that are uh, taking the intro exam certified advanced that there's a wait list of, um, of candidates that have been they've reached the the year uh, wait period but there's so many people that have already passed one part or two parts of it that are on the clock that they get priority in. right and so the invitation um, doesn't necessarily go out just if you have waited your allotted amount of time and so um, I mean I, I the goal for me whenever I first set out to do it was I wanted to um, sit the master exam at least one time by the time I was 30. And so I had to pass the advance this year at 29 to be able to, or I guess 28 to be able to do that. And then I was hoping to be able to um, sit next year, which would be 2014, which I would be 30. But I think with the wait list as it is, um, it'll probably be another year past that. So there's a long wait list. And in that time though, I gotta make sure that I, you know, stay on my game. Right. I don't just go into, um, the off switch mode, you know? So yeah, and not like, taste <laughs> okay, I got this, right? Yeah, I yeah. got it now. Okay, now I get the invite, you know, whenever it is, and and study for three months, you know? So I tried to uh, to help kind of mentor some some other uh, sommeliers and stuff, it really helps me and try to, you know, bring other people along. Um, but yeah, it's invitation only at, at that point. So hopefully that'll, that'll come in the mail, um, you yeah. know? Within the next two years or so. Well, good, but it's on their time. Yeah, they have they have multiple. You talked about like people have passed one thing, so they have like three components. Three components to right. it. Yeah, so just you, like the advanced. Like so, the advanced you have to pass um, all three components during that week um, for the master exam because the level of difficulty is significantly harder, but also the percentage. Um, so at the advanced, you have to get uh, sixty percent correct in, um, or maybe it's sixty five. I should know. <laughs> Let's say you, you passed, right? Yeah. Yeah. right? So um, in the three components, blind tasting of six wines in 25 minutes, um, a practical service exam, and then a, um, a theory exam. You have to get 60% uh, in each of those categories um, to pass at the advanced level. At the master level, it bumps up to 75%, and the level of knowledge gets to be more difficult. So once you get one of them done, you're quote unquote on the clock, and then you have three years um, or I guess an additional two years okay. to get that done. So you could pass one component each year um, and pass, if you say pass something like tasting the first go around and then service the second go around and then didn't get theory done the, the next go around, then you reset. You do it all over again. Yeah, yeah. so it's a significantly daunting exam. And, you know, that's kind of the process of it. You know, um, very few people pass the first time all three components. Um, there's a lot of people that, that reset. Um, you know, you pass when you're ready to pass. Yeah. And some people don't pass. So. No. Uh, we'll, we'll go video game mode for a second here. Um, it, similar to, not really similar, but we'll hearken it to uh, 
a video game I used to play way back in the day when I lived in Houston called Battletech, and there's also a game called Red Planet, and there are masters in yeah. this, and you have to pass a master exam of sorts you, by playing, and you, um, uh, for the Battletech, you have to defeat two of three masters in one-on-one -on -one combat, and you're allowed to die once, and <laughs> I know some people, and I passed the second time I did it, after playing the game for about five months, which... Let's put it this way, some of the masters were not happy that I passed. Really? But I did play against three really good masters and yeah. I just and a lot of it's luck. There is a lot of luck involved and, and that's what happened. I, I if the math the third master had hit me in the proper um, and the, these are battle mechs, these are robots, so you have two legs, two arms. Um, I had one leg that was missing or almost missing. If he had hit me in that leg instead of the fresh leg, I would have probably not passed. But yeah. that's okay. Well, uh, I think that's where the master exam is going. Is there's going to be hand and hand combat involved? Yeah. No, no. Oh, so I'm ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, so yeah. Had, so uh, so yeah. There's there's things. I, I know some people that have been uh, or that have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to pass the the master trial. Yeah. And never never pass it, but. Let me tell you, they'll kick your butt. Right. I mean, they're. they're I think they're better than I am ever yeah. ever at my peak. Yeah. But um, well, some of the sommeliers yeah. that you know I have the most um, respect for were many time pa I, fails. Like they pass it on their seventh time, pass it on their sixth time, and you know throughout that whole process, you gain humility. But you're all, you're stepping your game up every single time. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, and you think about that. If you can only sit the exam once a year. It's taking you seven years from the time you pass the advance, which was a significant undertaking to get done. Then you, you, you're like seven years of practicing your service and your theory and your and your tasting. Well, you're going to be like one of the best, you know. Yeah. As opposed, and not saying that the people that pass the first time aren't badasses, which because they are, but you know, it's just all part of that process, you know. And then some of the people that never never get it done, I have the utmost respect for as well. Yeah. They are some of the most talented tasters and the most gracious hosts, and you know, the, they know so much about wine. So I know. Yeah, I can tell you, you know, getting into wine is relatively recently. Um, the people that I've met that are not sommeliers or into the into the court but there are people out there that could tell you everything you want to know about wine absolutely they don't need it they don't need letters next to their name that, uh, to, to, to justify it but sure you know it, it's it is a I, I think for me also it is a personal kind of validation yeah um, it's but it's also in a professional sense it also was helpful yeah absolutely. you know I if you're, it shows it's just like a degree in, in anything you know it shows that you have devoted a significant amount of time and focus to a certain topic, then that you know, education is never a bad thing. I think no, sometimes, no. With, and our education is yeah. kind of fun to do. I right now, I'll tell you, it's like uh, <laughs> one of the the best parts about about uh, studying for like the service part of the exam. You know, you have to know spirits and cocktails and stuff. Well, the best way to learn cocktails is all right. Let's try it. it. Let's go check some out. Yeah, let me uh, let me build up the bar a little bit, make some on my own, but let's also go and drink some classic cocktails. So that part of the uh, the study process doesn't suck. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, let's let's kind of talk about um, Red Room Lounge and, okay. and what we're here for. And yeah. um, so, Red Room was hit about ten months, right? Yeah, we opened the first weekend in um, in June. So, yeah, about ten months. Yeah. Cool. And then, uh, well, and pr actually prior to that, we uh, we were talking about uh, you had personal wine. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that and what that is. Cause that, that's trust me, it's really cool. I, I checked out the site and I was telling Bill I, I like what you guys uh, yeah. did with that. Yeah. So personal wine is a is a great um, great concept. So it was founded by um, the partner here that I had in the lounge that we that we opened the, the red room with, but we also share offices and warehouse space and all of that with with personalwine.com. So the company's been around for over a decade, and um, really what the concept is is you can customize any type of label that you want for any type of occasion. Um, I think really what sets us apart is kind of two things, but first first and foremost, we work with some of the most well-respected wineries in the country, or actually globally, to, um, to source good juice. I mean, the wine that you're gonna buy from us isn't something that um, is you just added for sugar show, right? You yeah, added yeast to sugar. sugar. No, this like in, in, a, in a plastic jug. Yeah. Yeah. Like okay. Alex and I, so I found the CEO of that company is Alex Andrew. So Alex and I both know that we're not winemakers, but we also feel like we know from tasting and things like we had a good bottle of wine whenever we taste it. So, you know, we want to source some of the best, um, 
the best use that we can. So what has developed over the past decade is uh, partnerships with several different wineries to where they will um, bottle the wine in what we call shiners, where there's no front label to them. Um, all of the winery information, so you know, you know, the vintage and the grape variety and the breakdown, all of the stuff that shows the provenance of the wine is still on the back label. And then you can go onto our to the website, personalwine.com, and upload a photo, a logo, um, you can design um, a, a different background, you can use any type of different text. So we have our, our kind of our own uh, proprietary uh, template designer that um, allows you to customize any type of label that you want to. And then you choose your wines from, you know, we have like little mini champagnes that we sell for like I think like $8 a bottle or maybe $7 a bottle, something like that with the label on it, all the way up to like, yeah, I think we have Constant, um, their Diamond Mountain Claret on there for like 150 or something like that. So stuff all in between, you can get rosés, whites, uh, any type of varietals. We have about 35 different wines to choose from. So I'm involved with selecting those wines. Um, we get samples out the, the wazoo. So, you know, I'll probably taste maybe 150 wines a month or so, something along those lines. And, you know, from that, we'll select the 30 for the given um, season. Um, and then that really is kind of the reason why the lounge exists because uh, this space was here. Um, we, you know, we had offices and all that kind of stuff uh, in the back. And then this was like our private tasting area. But every time people would come in, um, actually, I started studying here. This was like my coffee shop. Right. Um, me and some of the other songs in town, like this is where we practice service. We attack practice blind tasting and we just loved it. And more and more people started coming in and they enjoyed it too. And so Alex, uh, you know, approached me about coming on and joining with you know being the sommelier for the resident sommelier for personalwine.com but then also opening um the red room concept too as well so you know personal wine kind of i always tell people kind of pays the bills for us if you will it is the the largest online retailer of uh customized labels um and we also do laser engraving too which is really badass yeah i saw that yeah um and accessories you know glasses and wood boxes um so it's the largest online retailer of, of that type of uh, product in the country um and so it's kind of kind of fun to be able to to work with that and it's i mean it's great for weddings you know you have yeah. a birthday coming up you can really do it you take your instagram photos all those effects and stuff <laughs> slap it on a bottle of wine that you know is you know good juice and um and you know give it away as gifts or have it at a you know a party or something like that it's a pretty pretty cool concept yeah so and i just thought about this we, we, Obviously, I do pre-interviews. We talk, we chat with you know, everyone's on the show. And I was telling Bill about the April Fool's thing I did today. We should. So I, should I should. I should have done that. We should. I should have. I should have thought about that. We should have done the the low key Pinot Noir. We will. We need to draft one of those up. You can just shoot me an image. We'll do one of those. Yeah, that would be fun, man. And as I thought about it, as, I, as, I, as where most people think at home, I'm sitting there going, man, I should have created a label, but I don't have time to create the label to to, to put in a fake press release. Right. So, um, yeah, you could have done it. Yeah, yeah. I just thought about that. Now. Wine. You can should have just done that. Thing. Yeah, the process really like you design everything on your own up front, and then you send it to us, and then our production team and graphics guys will make sure that it's you know up to the high resolution and things like that so that we can put it on a label. But then you have that, you know, you put it. Yeah, it would be fun. Yeah. In the future, but, you know, yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> hey, you know, when, when, when 1337 wine actually creates a wine, right, man, then, then, then we'll talk. Do. Yeah, but, we'll, yeah, uh, we'll come up was, with a blend that, or something. That was, uh, <laughs> I thought my little my little uh, press release was funny. I, I, I have really haven't seen, I haven't gone to the site yet to see if anyone else has done anything with it. I know a friend of mine did yeah. text me, thought it was funny. I told, and I told my dad about it, and I told him Loki, he was, and dad didn't know who Loki was, so, um, so I started thinking, man, I probably should have at least in the clues explained who Loki is. Yeah. Uh, and for you who don't know, Loki is the Norse god of, well, he's, he's the trickster god of the Norse mythology, right. so that's why April Fool's yeah. and all that. Anyway, well, and I don't know if you want to read all that, but today's April Fool's. Yeah. So. If you want to read all that, go go to the site and read the press release. It's a week later, because this will be up next Monday. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't so. think I told you that yet, but anyway, so that's what's the deal. Okay, so... Um, so we got the lounge. Uh, what are your what are your hours of operation? So the lounge, really, what we what we wanted to do, like I kind of alluded to at the beginning, was make a place that as a sommelier I wanted to drink at, but also that was um, late night. So we open at four o'clock, um, and you know, we sell wine retail during the day too. So we're a retail shop, but then um, in the in the bar lounge concept, we open at four o'clock on. Uh, 
Tuesday through Saturday. And then I stay open until midnight each night. It's kind of the thing where you know, I can stay open a little later. We just kind of see how it goes. So if people are in here hanging out, um, especially because of the late night, like we dim the lights down and these couches are meant to kind of swallow you up a little bit. Right, so, yeah. uh, you know, midnight is our is our printed hours and then on Saturday, stay open until one. So what's kind of happened with the, with the concept is, um, you know, we, we wanted to make a, a spot that was um, kind of the place where Psalms getting off of a shift uh, would want to come and hang out. And since there's, you know, downtown, there's a lot of restaurants around. Right. We yeah, kind of have turned into that. Right around here, you got a few. Yeah. 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 yeah we've got we've got quite a few different uh, different spots, and you know, guys that I'm good friends with and study with. You know, we all kind of work within the same uh, proximity here. So you know, it's not uncommon at you know 12:30 at night to have you know five or six of the you know most well known sommeliers in Austin uh, down here just hanging out and drinking champagne, kind of kind of chilling. So. And we stay open late night. Really, the whole concept is just about wine enjoyment. I mean, what I, as a sommelier, what I try to um, pride, I, I try to, I pride myself on the fact that I can be um, extremely um, easy to talk to, welcoming, and non-pretentious to the neophyte. So somebody that is just trying to get into wine, if you like Moscato with ice cubes in it, then I'm gonna give you ice cubes. I am not someone to judge. You're drinking wine, you're enjoying it, you're the only one that's drinking it, so you know you should drink it how you enjoy it. Um, and so I feel like you know, we really have created a spot that's welcoming to people that are new into wine and just kinda of wanna hang out and chill, um, but also people that are wanting to learn more about it. Um, I do a wine list by the glass, 10 to 12 wines, I hand write and I switch it up about every three to four weeks. So we do new stuff, I always pour people taste, you can always try some of the new stuff that's out there. And I get kinda of geeky on that part of it, not to be uh, just geeky for the sense of being for the sake of being wine geeky, but yeah, to so try new Greco stuff. New York yeah. that, that's like he doesn't care. Yeah. Right, yeah. Screw it, but it's my yeah. list. Yeah. Right. That's not what I'm trying to do with that per se. I, I like to, I just feel like there's so many great value wines that fall into a price point that I can pour them by the glass. So I try to switch them up as much as possible. Um, and then we have a pretty big list. So, you know, the list fluctuates, but I mean, it's usually in between 400 to five, uh, 500 different labels. We've got a you know, big seller here in the back. And so, you know, we have some some real gems in there, some older, like I was telling you, some older, you know, birds. You got the six liter of yeah. uh, 78 Latache and, um, you know, 1945 Chateau Mouton and, and things like that. So if people come in and they're, um, they're savvy and they want to talk, you know, some about some more, I guess, serious or expensive wines, if you right. will. Um, I like to feel like, you know, I have the knowledge to be able to accommodate them. And also, you know, we're prepped to, um, to give them the, the type of service that you need. So it's not like a, a fine dining type of lounge. You can be casual, but if I need to bust out the decanter and we're doing candlelight and you know I've got the right. filters and all that kind of stuff, then you know we'll do that as well. We'll give the wines due justice. So that was kind of the concept with the, with the spot. Accessible to everybody. Something cool for everybody. Cool, yeah, uh, I mean, this is, uh, I like, I like, the, I like the, how the, the room is set up. Uh, we've got some nice couches here. Um, you've got, uh, you can't see it, but over here on the wall, we've got you know, all, got a lot of the wines highlighted. Uh, you got the cool guitars, which you can barely see in the camera. Yeah. I know yeah. it's just it's how it's set up, but you got some cool guitars. I'm sure Jeremy this Parson, is a, does. Doctor Parson actually, come down here and love this stuff. Yeah, he, he jams out with Alex yeah. from time to time. But yeah. this one right here is actually signed by. Um, we had Atlantic Records um, come in during South by Southwest just a couple of weeks ago, and they had kind of a standing reservation actually in this couch area for right, yeah. all their bands. And so um, media would come in and do interviews. So we got all the bands that came in to sign it. So that was great to get to to drink a little wine with those guys. And then Alex, he's a huge blues guitar. Uh, fan he plays but he also you know just just kind of lives the the music side of it so like this guitar here Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble yeah. got you know BB King Austin so, icon by the yeah. way yeah <laughs> so it, it ties in well you know Austin being the live music capital of the world so we've got the wine part of it we always try to play what we consider to be decent music and uh, and then you know the guitar is kind of tie in well yeah too, so it's got a you know it's just a chill vibe to it we kind of piecemealed all the uh, the furniture together you know a lot of this stuff was uh, was used some Craig, great Craigslist, Craigslist lines yeah. and things like that, and it was all about just kind of keeping it slightly eclectic, keeping it comfortable, and um, you know we we wanted to uh, just kind of have it all tie in together if we could. So it took us a little while. Uh, I told Jeremy uh, at some point in time when I come up, I'll bring my bring my keys, my axe. Yeah, man. And I'll, I'll dust. Out. I'll dust off the the rust. 
of probably a decade in the lounge some night. a decade of rust on my fingers there, <laughs> and I, I, I'll probably just stick to strictly one, four, five chords, and yeah, and and that's about it. Maybe a solo. Maybe maybe I'll be fancy. I'll do a two or six chord. So if you're a musician, you know exactly why I just said. If you're not a musician, don't worry about it. Yeah, I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wine is the extent of what uh, I. Yeah, like I told you I when I, once I found out that music is math. Um, I, I totally geeked out on that side of things. Yeah. Um, all right, so we we just like uh, had some nice bubblies here. Yeah, tell, yeah. tell us what we just had. Champagne. So um, you know, I my, know this is not our what we're like tasting, tasting. We're yeah. gonna taste a couple other wines, but we kind of start off with yeah. This. Well, this is the label that was kind of screwed up, but I can still tell you. Oh yeah. So um, champagne is. I mean, that's what I drink more so than anything else. People are always surprised about that. Like, what's your favorite wine? What do you drink more so than anything? I'm like, bubbles. If I can afford champagne, I'm drinking champagne all the time. But um, and I think it's a product of a couple of things. Um, I think it's, you know, it's Texas, it's hot, it's warm, I'm from right. the area, so I, I grew up drinking Dos Equis, you know, and refreshing style beers, so, um, you know, champagne with high acid, clean finish to it is something that I that I love, and so I kind of got into drinking uh, some of the bigger house stuff, I mean, I, I of course, have had, like, Moe, and I used to sell, like, the, you know, the Imperial and um, Veuve Clicquot Yellow Label and things right. like that, but I think as you kind of grow, and any time that people drink more and more champagne, you start to realize that there's this whole kind of, like, subset of champagnes that fall into the grower-producer camp, and grower-producer, is you know, just for the, kind of the audience out there, they legally, you know, European law, especially French wine law, um, is very regimented about what you can and can't call yourself. But they have two initials on the labels, uh, RM, Recoltant Manipulant, um, and that means that they have to grow a minimum 95% of their own grapes, as opposed to the Negociant Manipulant, which is the big house champagne like the Vuclicos, where they purchase the majority of their grapes. So. I've been into uh, grower champagne for a matter of years now, and, and I love the fact that uh, I feel like the quality's getting better, and more and more people are drinking them, and really you don't spend any more money th right. than you would if you bought a big house champagne. They just, the big house champagnes just have done a phenomenal job of marketing themselves. So, you know, grower champagne, this is uh, from a producer called uh, Godme. Um, they are, uh, th this blend here is just their Premier Cru uh, Vineyards multi-vintage blend, so that, you know, blending across different vintages. I believe that the majority of this is 09, um, it's 09, 08, 09, and 10, but majority 09 um, vintage. 50% uh, Chardonnay, 35% Pinot Meunier, and then the remainder is, is Pinot Noir. And, you know, just, just more nuanced kind of, um, you know, that really classic mineral-driven kind of doughy, yeasty style. Oh, yeah. The Meunier, I think, kind of kicks up the florals a little bit. Um, and it's something that I sell in the lounge for $15 a glass. So, you know, as we were talking earlier. Yeah, that's an that incredible price. Point, price. Yeah, and it's something that, that we drink a lot of. <laughs> when, some, when, you know, fellow sommeliers coming to, to the lounge, this is usually kind of what we start off with. But, um, you know, just, just great stuff that uh, that you don't, like retail. I sell it retail for 50 bucks. Yeah. And it's, that's what you're going to spend on a lot of big And this is, this is, I mean... Uh, we start off with this, you know, kind of chatting. We're sipping on the champagne here, and you know, it, it's it's wonderful. Like as soon as you poured it, I uh, sucked my nose into it. You know, got really that that got all that 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 uh, bakery pastry yeah. stuff. Yeah, was, like fresh like that bread, bread, bread dough. Fresh, right? Yeah, that bread dough. Yeah. Um, great stuff. Um, so and a great way to start things. And you know, I, I like personally, I like starting with bubbles. Yeah, absolutely. you know, whether whether it's before my meal or with a salad. I really like that type of that type of wine because you know I, I think people tend to not drink enough of it. Uh, they think it's just for special occasions yeah. when it's 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 wine and it's so much it's more just than a be breakfast wine is what I tell people. Yeah, right. It doesn't need mimosa right? all day. Yeah, I mean I drink. I for me there's two, kind of two reasons I guess. Like I like the refreshing style, high acid because it's hot, but also whenever you drink a lot of champagne throughout the course of the night, you don't have to worry about your teeth turning dark, dark red. God, whenever yeah. you're drinking red, I'm on. one of those people that my teeth yeah. come black. Yeah, so I, I'm know, jealous of the people that that they, they just get, get a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I hate that. Yeah, so this <laughs> this is one way to avoid that: drink more champagne. That's right. right. You know, I, I agree with you. It's, that acid will clean up the palate if you had a coffee before dinner or whatever, you know, kind of clean up the palate, get it ready for the rest of the meal. Um, great with salads, great with any appetizers. I mean, champagne is the way to go to start off. Yeah. Anything, really. I mean, and it's not for a special occasion. It's for yeah. just you deserve it. Exactly. I've never been, hand, never been handed a glass of champagne and not instantly been in a better mood. 
That's right. Right. That's right. I mean, when, that's, when you said, should we start with that? I was like, yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, why not? Yeah. yeah, someone hands me champagne. And, you know, like uh, Riesling or White Burgundy kind of puts me in this, or Burgundy in general. Like, here you go, here's a glass of this. And then I'm off. I'm like, yes, I'm in a better mood instantly. So Bubbles kind yeah. of just does that stuff. So, yeah, try to drink as much of it as possible. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so we got a couple wines we're going to try here, right? Yeah, let's do it, man. We got yeah. some fun stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And so he already told me about these. And this white wine, um, well, both wines I'm excited about, but this white wine, in particular, I'm excited about because it it's something I've never had before. Yeah, so, so that's right. why I love this stuff. Yeah, this. I mean, this is kind of kind of geeky, um, okay. but that's you know, this is a wine show, and so we can and we can a, get away with geek. that. Yeah, thirteen thirty seven. So yeah, we, right. we went we we went geek. All yeah. right, and, and this is this is a wine too though that in Texas, but just as the time of the year that it is, we're starting to warm up a little bit. People should know about these wines and they should they should drink them. So this is from a producer called Ganetta. Um, this is a Spanish white wine that is called Chocoli, and it's spelled crazy. It's T X uh, A K O L I N A, uh, Chocolina. Um, it is from kind of northern Spain um, on the you know Iberian Peninsula. There, it's close to uh, the Atlantic, so you get a very uh, I guess like saline type of character to it to me. I get a lot of uh, It's very very mineral driven a lot of citrus to it. They bottle is super fresh too. So you get some inherent uh, CO2 so you can kind of see yeah, you know, just a little bit of like a little Absolutely, bit of bubbly yeah. in there And a, another beautiful thing about this is it's it's ten and a half percent alcohol So, you know, I, the trend I think for a lot of people it, Especially if people talk about you know balance and wines and global warming, and, you know, they want to drink lower alcohol wines but you know, if you're drinking um, some of this maybe on, in the afternoon or at lunch, um, you're not going to have to worry about getting a butt. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's a glass of this, a glass and a half of this between three people. And I think, so I think, uh, I think, I think with wine, wine, and I, I guess with good beers, more than say with liquor, is that you're ta you're drinking it for the pleasure of drinking it as far as the taste and the aromas rather than I'm drinking my shots of Jaeger because I just want to get messed up. Drinking for the effect, right? Yeah, yeah we're drinking for for flavor. I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't hurt that there's a little bit of that yeah, in yeah, there, yeah, right? Because yeah. that's relaxing and it's conducive to, to conversation. But I agree completely. I mean, we're we're enjoying this because of the, the flavor, its uh, refreshing character, and how it pairs with food, right? right. And it's, so we don't need to have 19% alcohol. Yeah, I don't need to get buzzed. To and get like you were saying that there's a similarity with Albarino. Uh, yeah. And things absolutely. like things like even Vino Verde in, in Portugal with their low alcohol. You know, it's, it's refreshing and that's where, you know, especially with this time of year and we start getting into the summer. Yeah. Um, again, it's about the refreshing part and you don't want, you don't want 15% no, no, white wines to in your, in your face. Or reds, style. Yeah, yeah, that's just like going to be like a lot of alcohol. I mean, this this wine by you know keeping lower alcohol, it, the acidity level is significantly higher. So it's you know just that super crisp, clean. The CO two that's in there, um, you know, also kind of helps with that that refreshing characteristic to it. And I think the the correlation that you made with Vino Verde and Alvarino and uh, yeah, from Spain and Portugal, and then also um, you know here in uh, in Basque country is where this is from in Spain. Very very similar style to it. You know the influence of the ocean comes through, so you get that sea spray kind of character. Yeah. It just like smells like like oysters or oyster shell and things like that. But then um, you know a lot of that like citrus character to it. And this is from a super unique grape variety too. Andorabi Zuri is the name of of the grape variety. So something that's I think off people's radars um in, in some kind of you know in our circles people definitely know uh Chocolina because we geek out over it but the value is there that's another reason why we geek out over it. so this is not a super expensive white wine you know something you go into a restaurant spend 35 bucks on and uh you know have it have a great bottle of wine right and yeah break the bank so well and, and i really get that minerality um you know I, and it probably because a lot of a lot of conversation makes me think of when I as a kid would visit my grandparents in Florida yeah um, so in, in the sense of that minerality and, and the houses a lot of the houses are built with cinder block yeah um, so there's um, that type of that type of feeling yeah I hear what you you're saying. so but well, think about it, if it like it had rained in the afternoon on like a cinder block or like on somebody's house and then right. the sun came out and so yes. to evaporate that that's kind of what I think of yeah, like so what pavement type of character right with that um, with that uh, that sea spray 
type of note to it. And then you're then you're definitely getting all the citrus on it. Yeah, tons of citrus. I mean, that key lime, yes. that lemon zest, you know, kind of like that that bitter uh, bitter grapefruit pith kind of note comes through, just really zesty. And and, and for the record, I, I can't tell you how stoked I am the past few days that I actually can smell and taste things. So for the last video when I couldn't taste or smell anything, uh, last Thursday was the first time I've had any wine since then, and I actually was able to taste and smell it. And today, <clears throat> you know, it's just, um, I mean, <clears throat> the past few days are probably the best I've felt physically, because yeah. I've really been just coughing and coughing and just and whatever. But so being able to smell the nuances yeah. has, has been, uh, from this wine and even from Thursday when I was drinking some wine, is, is phenomenal. Well, this, this is a pretty delicate wine. I and mean, there's nothing <clears throat> worse than being stuffed up and then having the allergies and not being able to get some of the, the different layers to. Now, it's, you know, relative, I don't say it's simplistic, but it's relatively straightforward, but there's some different degrees here. And, you yeah. know, there's some real subtleties that, um, um, that are kind of nice to, to pick up, um, especially with something that's just kind of light and crisp and clean in style. You know, there's some there's some nice uh, nice elements to this. this and wine. especially for me, with a lot of times with white wines, I will struggle with with the nose. Uh, but this one, I'm not struggling. Yeah, you know, I'm really able to pick up some good stuff. And of course, it could be that kind of the not doing it for a while. Has, has maybe heightened the sense. Yeah, you're more you in know. tune, you're more focused in. I mean, for a, for a delicate wine, I think on the body, this wine definitely would be delicate. The aromatic intensity definitely comes out. Sometimes, like in blind tastings, I struggle with uh, the more subtle and non-aromatic white wines like Gruner Veltlin or Pinot Grigio or mm -hmm. Alvarino. I confuse those a lot because they don't jump out of the glass. But this wine's at, at a perfect temperature too. It's just you know slightly slightly warmed up from right out of the fridge, and, but the aromatics are right, great. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a fun wine. So, you know, just hanging out, eating outside, you know, porch wine, having some seafood, no, salads, you know, this, or just, I don't even think you need any food with this wine. This, yeah, you know? this could be a non, non-food, yeah. you could totally make this for non-food, yeah. but. Yeah, you just know, walking you, a couple blocks in the middle of the summer, you need something refreshing in style. Yeah, town you know, lake, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Put it in a, into a solo cup and uh, there you go. Right, you're yeah, good that, to go. That song, right? The red solo cup song. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, man, I, I've, I've been there before. We've, I think we've all uh, enjoyed wine out of uh, many different containers. Vessels? Yeah. yeah. Vessels from one time to the other. And, and it works, man. Like you I know? said, I'm not one to judge. So if someone drinks it out of the bottle, too, more power to you. It's all about drinking it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and really on... On, on the palate, I mean, first of all, the, the great acidity, um, and I even felt like I got a little bit of orange out of it, um, you know, and, and on the nose, I got some more of the floral aspect. I, yeah. I struggle with floral because it's kind of like, I, I can never get a specific flower, so it's, right. to me, it's just like, I'll just say white flowers because it feels like that type sure. of stuff. Sure, I agree um, with that. I, I guess with... White flower, like Azalea. citrus blossom, you know, kind of it all ties into it, but right. I'm not a botanist, so yeah. I've, I've never been uh, super... Uh, as, as a kid, we had azaleas too. at the house, so I'd equate it probably the closest thing to that. Yeah, yeah that's good. You know, I, I, one thing that I kind of can uh, can cue in on is just like honeysuckle. Not that I don't think this necessarily has that sweet kind of floral character, but growing up, those were mm -hmm. round, you know, and like those are some of those floral characters you can get to it. But azalea, I can definitely see. I just, it just doesn't come to mind just right off the bat. And, and then honestly, for me to pull that word out of my mouth, <laughs> out of my head, is, is pretty rare because I don't necessarily equate a lot of floral with, with what I grew up because we didn't have a lot of flowers, we had, you know, a few here and there, but yeah. I was never into smelling the flowers anyway, so. Right. No, this is, a, I, I really like this a whole lot and um, would love uh, to have, you know, I would love to be sitting sitting outside or, you know, just, just enjoying it. Yeah. You know, on a nice spring or even hot summer day. Yeah. You know, I think we've kind of turned the corner with, um, with the temperature uh, here in Austin. I mean, we'll see if we cool off or whatever, but this is going on my, my buy the glass list starting this week. So tomorrow, um, because it's, it's that time to have these style of wines, just yeah. easy drinker, you know, crisp, clean, refreshing style to it. And, um, and that's one of the things that's kind of fun. A lot of people have never heard of Chocolate. For yeah. one, it's a fun as hell word to say, Chocolina, yeah. Chocolina, um, you know, and introduce somebody to, to something new. So yeah, this is going to buy the glass next week. And in places like Texas or the South, um, you know, we can, this is a good time to start this stuff. Whereas if you were up in, you know, up in New York and Chicago or yeah, Northern Climes, it's still, time yet, right? you still could get snow. Right. <laughs> I know. I, I, I have, I've seen it snow in yeah. April. <laughs> I went to college in, uh, in the Midwest and 
one of the junior year I distinctly remember it was like April the 10th and it was snowing after we had had like some beautiful days prior yeah, to right? it and I was like I am such a southerner like this is depressing <laughs> to me like I am not used to you know being from Texas going to school in Illinois I was a culture shock for me but yeah definitely I'll do that. yeah <laughs> yeah I, I can remember um, you know living in Chicago I, I can remember um, you know those seven years every once in a while the, the late you know, late, late snow happening. I mean, nothing yeah. that was blizzard, but you're like, really? Yeah. It's snowing right now? Yeah, I know. We don't even... And why why am I still thing. here? I, I should be back in Texas. I hear you. So. I hear you. Yeah, that was... Uh that was one of those things. I love that area, but whew, I'm just not used to the cold on it. So, yeah. well, should we try the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Let's let's hop into this one. Okay. So this is a yeah. Another this, this is this was fun because when you were telling me about this, that's when we started talking about my my yeah, April so, Fool's so thing. This is Pinot Noir. It's not Loki, but it's not Loki, uh, but it is Pinot Noir. So. Um, I've, I've had a couple of different uh, German Pinots that I've that have sold here in the lounge. This has been my favorite to date. This is from um, a producer that is based out of Baden in Germany, um, and his name is Bernhard Hubert, and he makes a lineup of spectacular single vineyard wines that are really modeled off of a Burgundian Grand Cru type of um, model, I think, we're, but they also kind of carry that price point to an extent. Right. So I love the whole lineup that he makes. This is actually just the, just bought in Appalachian, so it's not single vineyard specific. Uh, 2010 Pinot Noir, which is known in Germany as Spot Burgunder. Um, and I think that in, in there, so I also I sell in the lounge for like 50 bucks, so it's not you know super expensive. And as we were kind of talking earlier, like when I tell people about this Pinot in particular, but kind of Germany, I try to put it in kind of perspective of like, so it's not nearly as like ripe and fruit driven of style as La Sonoma Russian River Pinot can be. And then it kind of bridges the gap in between two other areas with Oregon, which to me always is a little bit more restrained on the fruit, a little bit higher acid, cooler climate there, a little bit more herbal character, typically a little bit less oak influence. And then Burgundy, which is, you know, the tertiary, the non-fruit flavors really speak to me about where the place is, the soil and things like that. The fruit is much more tart um, and you get a lot more of those those herbal characteristics and then what we, sometimes people describe as like that funky kind of, you know, barnyard type of the funk. George Clinton. Yeah. That kind of comes through, which can be a big big turnoff to people. George Clinton in the wine. I hear it. Yeah. So, <laughs> I feel like Germany kind of bridges that gap in between Oregon and Burgundy in the sense that you get pleasant fruit that finishes I think a little bit more tart than um, than Oregon does but then you get all those nice kind of like mineral driven earth flavors herbal flavors there's no new oak to this at all um, that you would associate with burgundy but it's not quite as um, as funky so people that maybe aren't into old world wines um, or they're they're wanting to but they don't I don't want to you know pull out something that's uh, you know kind of a uh, a real funky George Clinton style burgundy. <laughs> this really helps bridge the gap for me. And the price I think is great. This one is elegant and like balanced. It's just killer German Pinot. And like I said, the price, because I don't, there's not a huge demand for people like, oh, I have to have German Pinot as opposed to Oregon or Russian River. Right. This really comes in at, a, at an awesome price point to enjoy. So. Yeah, and, and I, I've, I've had a few German Pinots. And I've said I've I've enjoyed them all, so I'm, yeah. I'm excited about it. Especially when you described it earlier, I was excited to try this. So yeah. So yeah, I mean there there's there is that that hint of little funk in there, mm -hmm. which I like by the way because we had that discussion about funk and all that, and and I I do like a little bit of that. Yeah, I think you know it's a it's another layer in the wine that sometimes when the wines are, the pinots are so fruit driven that they lack. Right. In a lot of capacities, it's really, um, you know, an, an enjoyable nuance as long as it doesn't get to be too much. As we were discussing yeah. earlier, kind of like with, you know, Britannomyces, can be like a nice little supplementary type of thing to it if you have Brett in the wine, but also if it's out of whack, then, then you're you know, kind of like, yeah, yeah. you know, it, you know, it, in a lot of old world, it's, it's already evident in the old, a lot of the old world wineries because it's it, once you get it, it's 
very difficult to get rid of. Yeah. But if you've got like the newer world pristine winery yeah. and it and it's in there, it was obviously not supposed to be in there. Right. Yeah, and especially if it's a fruit driven style wine right. and then you have some of these characteristics that you associate with the old world and you're like, eh, I don't know if that's really working out. So, you know, being that this is a little a little bit more of an old world style, um, or it is an old world style. I think that little kind of nuance of the it, it, it kind of reminds me of like just a little bit of like uh, composting um, right. um, leaves or something mm -hmm. like that or like fresh turned potting soil kind of a note to it forest floor kind of a note with a but then the, the kind of a fruit floral character comes through it I get you know I get some good cherry out of it some good stuff now we're gonna try this Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the acid's up, but it's not too much. It's not like just completely tired. The wine is not thin by any stretch of the imagination. It's got good depth of flavor to it. Um, you know, you want to talk about food wines. I mean, Pinot is a is a is a gimme uh, in a lot of ways. You know, it's like okay, I can throw in a food wine pairing situation, throw Burgundy out there at a lot of different times. So you know, Pinot is an extremely food friendly wine. But I mean, I feel like this wine is is pretty pretty beautiful in that sense that. If you wanted to, poultry, duck, uh, pork even, I think would work with this. Oh, yeah. But you could do fish dishes as well. I had, I had a pork tenderloin recently, yeah, absolutely. and this would have gone perfectly with it. Yeah. You know, the sad part is it's, it's off that particular restaurant's menu now. Ah. But, you know, and I'm, I killed myself for not trying it right. earlier. Yeah. I was so mad. It was their seasonal menu, and, and I finally had it, and I, I just like, really? It, is a, it was a smoked balsamic. But so smoked balsamic and it was just one of would do I'm perfect with this. Yeah. This thing would have been awesome. Because yeah. there's a bit of that smokiness to it. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, I think the herbal character now, like on the yeah. second or third taste, really comes through. It's like a you know, like fresh oregano, um, like a basil kind of character comes through. Like and one of the descriptors that I love for Pinot Noir that I really get in this, if you have ever bought like the tomatoes on the vine or you've grown tomatoes at your house and you pick the tomato leaf when it's kind of sticky and it's okay. fresh or whatever and you kind of get that like green like tomato-y but it's the herbal character of it that comes out to me in this and I love that smell from growing. I'm gonna have to try fresh, that because uh, tomatoes. We, we, we have tomatoes at the house. I don't eat, to, I don't eat, eat tomatoes. Yeah. I, mean, I, like, I like what you make out yeah. of them. Right. I just like eating them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'll try those leaves. Vine, try the leaf. Just like crunch it up in your hand and just smell it and it's, it's not like you know a, and an herb that you like cook with spiciness wise, but it does have a kind of a delicate note to it that I love, and I think that's really that and, and comes I, through in this. I like the fact you said oregano, because as soon as you said it, I was like, that's what I'm getting out of mm -hmm. this, you know. And oregano is is a, is a great is a great um, descriptor, and and I love oregano. Yeah, I really do. I mean, well, gr growing up, uh, you know, in a half Italian family, right? Uh, yeah, you know, your oregano is yeah. I mean, yeah that's that's why I was like, oh my goodness, so, so that, many different the whole dishes. tomato connection and yeah. Well, you know, I, I, my introduction into um, the kind of the fine dining type of area was, was the Italian, Italian right? Yeah, restaurant. That's right. Those, those type of smells and and tastes really uh, resonate with me and. Um, you know, this is a wine. I just got introduced to it about three months ago, so I hadn't sold it before. But I know that this would just kill with a lot of different pasta dishes. I mean, we had a whole range. Of Absolutely, I, I'm just I, I'm digging the whole that the whole pasta sauce thing. Yeah, and just yeah, it, it's yeah, yeah. You know, and and prior to prior to talking, you know, I was telling you that there there is a I, I still have a struggle with Pinot Noir and Rieslings. Uh, it's it's not that I struggle with it, but there's I guess. Falling in love with with the grape mm -hmm. is more than anything else because uh, Pinot Noirs in general, people all over, whether they're a Psalm or just a wine enthusiast, love it. And then uh, Riesling seems to be like that darling, that darling wine. And, and and during our study groups, we've had some good Rieslings, and so I, I I'm starting to understand, especially the food pairing aspect with sure. Riesling. Yeah. But it's it's you know as I get introduced into better quality Rieslings and, and Pinot Noirs. Um, I'm, I'm starting to really understand what's so nice about them because right. I guess my first experience with the Pinot Noir, I won't name the producer, uh, which is kind of funny that I actually remember which one it was, um, but they're well known out right. of California. And I was like, this wine sucks. Yeah. Like it was, and, and this is before I had that, that moment of I really liked wine. It was just kind of like, you know, I'll probably try this wine. It was with barbecue, so it was probably not the best, we'll find the most ideal setting right. for it. 
but um, and it's kind of funny that I actually remember that particular night of where I was and how I had that and that I disliked it so wine. much yeah and I just like the wine so much yeah um, but uh, I think that's really where the whole me and Pinot Noir happened yeah. was the was the turnoff um, sure. but now that I've gotten into the group and I've and gotten into wine more yeah you know I've gotten to really appreciate Pinot Noir a little bit better yeah. so well this is what ha has happened with Pinot it's it's the sideways effect okay so you know Merlot is a Classic grape, yeah. Just awesome wines, classic wines. <laughs> Napa Valley, absolutely. You know, I mean, the wine, of course, sideways, the whole thing. It's like yeah. the, the very end, you drink it Cheval Blanc. It's Merlot based, of course. You know, I mean, Merlot is a phenomenal wine. But what happened was, it was easy to say for people. And right, it was very drinkable and gulpable. So they overproduced it, and there was such a variable range of quality that you know a lot of the stuff at the lower end. I mean, you could even spend twenty, twenty-five bucks on a bottle and still it would it would be lackluster well what has happened is that effect now has happened to Pinot because, because it became so popular Pinot right? yeah. is popular Pinot, yeah. Pinot is you know I'm not drinking any F and Merlot I'm drinking Pinot so now you have these Pinot Noirs that are popping up that are I mean I have had many Pinots in the 20 to 15 to 25 dollar price point that should not be they're they're not good but people are going to buy them based on name recognition alone and so i think that that you know that's the case it's that i've had people that are like you know i'm really turned off to pinot i don't like pinot they're thin yeah. they're watery they're too they're too tart they're you know just or they have too much oak to them and things and that's just because there's a lot more pinot in the market i think because people are drinking it the quality kind of has gotten watery. right yeah and and you know like, like talk about merlot i mean i i, I really like merlot and that so and I kind of came into all this a little bit late, so Sideways had already been out, and I'd heard about the Sideways effect, and I was like, okay, what's the big deal? And then I watched the movie, and I thought it was funny, and especially, you know, talking about uh, drinking Cheval Blanc, and, and just, you know, the, say, the average person kind of adopting that, I don't really want to drink Merlot, but yet they're drinking in Bordeaux, and like, you realize there's Merlot in it, right? Yeah. And if you're drinking this side of the, of the, of the Merlot, or Bordeaux area, you're drinking probably more Merlot than the Cab, and... So I mean I think uh, you know I I think that uh, uh, it did give Merlot a really bad bad name. Oh, oh it did. Producers, I feel bad for him too because it was it wasn't necessarily justified, and I don't think that the the scope was anticipated as how oh, popular. No, I don't think it really. Be. Yeah, I don't think but, at all yeah, that it was no, meant to. Yeah, no, it was no, not so. meant to be. It was it was I, yeah. From from watching the movie a few times, I've not read the actual book that it was based on. I think was actually called Sideways, right? Yeah. I, I don't think the intent was to badmouth Merlot. It was yeah. really more about the character. I think so. <laughs> yeah, just kind of in how it was portrayed because that's such a such a like a defining scene in that movie. Well, it's you know it's funny. I just heard recently. Uh, People are drinking Merlot, but they're drinking it in a uh, in a different way, um, and it's from Argentina, and it's as easy to pronounce, and it tastes almost exactly the same. It's called Malbec. Um, yeah, so, huh. you know, people. Uh, I, I heard this that you know, people like the, bet, the number one wine that I sell here in the lounge is the Malbec that I sell by the glass, which is great. I mean, it's a great Malbec. I taste a lot of them, and um, you know, Malbec is a category that over delivers for what you pay. Um, but I heard from a from a master sommelier recently that yeah like everybody's drinking Malbec everybody's selling Malbec because it's Merlot with a fancy name and so you know that's it kind of I think it's the it's the same it's the same type of deal you know it, it's lush it's dark fruit it's soft it's got you know yeah big flavor to it and it's it's easy to drink and it's easy to say so it's that, that little varietal Bordeaux kind of like pushed away yeah they kind of kicked out right and, yeah. and now it's uh making a huge name for itself but no, 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 I'm cool with that too, but in the grand scheme of things, like Malbec, Merlot, I think a very, very similar type of just overall yeah. profile. And, uh, you know, people are still drinking Merlot, if you will. It's just in the form of Malbec. And, I th and, and that's, that I'm, I'm glad you made that connection because I, I have, and I don't know if I would struggle this point, but I have in the past struggled with Malbec, which is kind of funny because I've told people about this. Like, how can you, how can you not identify a South American Malbec? So because I, because every time I do a blind on it, I think it's Washington Merlot. Yeah, you know, and yeah. and 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 some people kind of like I don't understand, but other people are like no, I I see why you say that. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, I think very like structurally, it can be very very similar. You can you know have alcohol levels about the same, tannin levels about the same, same amount of acid and, and oak regiment to it. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, especially if you have a New World wine, like, you know, New World, either Napa or Washington Merlot, compared to a Malbec, and there's a decent amount of new oak on it, there's yeah. a lot of similarities there. Dark fruit, there's floral tones, some like, you know, pyrazine kind of green herbal or green yeah. tones to it. That can be, uh, can be a, a tough, you know, identifying wine in a in a blind tasting, and I, that's why I think it's popular for people. It's, yeah, it's very very similar. And, and I've, I've I've seen that happen to myself where I've you know they've they've poured me the, the Malbec and I'm like, and and I've gone this is Merlot, right, <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. you know, and, I, and I'll even go wash it because I'm like this is not really California, right. So if it's not California, where else can it be? I mean, it could be anywhere in the country. We know that when you're doing blinds, but you start thinking about well, what's most likely going to happen. Right. It's like, well, if it's not California, then it's probably Washington. I doubt it's Oregon, and I doubt it's going to be New York. So, no, yeah. or any of the of the other forty six. So, yeah. The only other one you're going to get is going to be, uh, yeah, Washington. Well, I yeah. Think, you know, Washington Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and. Syrah. Those wines are, I think, new into like the sommelier testable realm. Right. But I think they are a classic style, and there's some awesome stuff that's out there. I think, in particular, Syrah. But actually, at the intro exam that I helped, uh, just you know, pouring the wines and kind of setting up the room and stuff about two months ago, uh, one of the testing wines was Washington Merlot. So, yeah. you know, it's definitely a region that is uh, that's kind of honing in on those varieties and making some killer stuff. Yeah, I've, I've had some great stuff from Washington. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome stuff. Um, so let's, we were kind of, kind of, we're actually are kind of in a wrap up point. Yeah. Um, uh, you want to talk about more Red Room or do you want to talk about anything else in particular? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, if anybody, uh, you know, out there, out there watching wants to come by and see us, like I said, Tuesday through, uh, through Saturday around four o'clock, we kick it off. And, you know, it's a, it's kind of a hidden spot. So uh, yeah. you just got to look for uh, the 306A on the door. Our actual address is uh, 306 East 3rd Street, um, Suite A in Austin, and that's in the 78701. But, you know, we try to stay relatively engaged, social media stuff as well. Um, you know, so Red Room ATX is us on Twitter, uh, Red Room ATX on Facebook. I do the at Bill LC on, on Twitter, and you know, talk wine. And I love the the Twitterverse. I get so many people reach out to me about, uh, what do you think about this wine? Or yeah. what some wines you should try? Had somebody actually just right before this, I'm out in Fredericksburg in the Hill Country. What wineries would you recommend? Told them to go see per the guys at Pertinalis. And, yeah, they were awesome. You know, I so love them. I love, you know, anybody watching that you know, wants to get engaged and, um, you know, either come check us out here or, you know, just, um, you know, have a little rapport going on uh, on the interwebs. Yeah, and you were talking about like there is that the little bit of that underground and hidden style yeah. because and, and I knew that before coming here um, by visiting the website and, and doing a little research about it. You know, it doesn't say Red Room Lounge on the outside. It says Personal yeah. Wine, actually. Right. Yeah. You know, but but so it's kind of like it's kind of like that little secret. You have to know it's here. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, especially walking down at this area, it's like eleven o'clock at night or something. You know, you had. A, had a, a nice meal and you're kind of looking for the spot. We keep it hidden just because 50 seats downtown fills up relatively quickly and all yeah. we're really trying to do here is create a relaxed vibe. So you gotta seek it out. But yeah, if you look for the, the awning that says personal wine on it, people that see this interview will know the, the connection with personal wine. And, um, and then there's also a red light that we light up at night too. So yeah. it's hidden though. I mean, it's industrial. It doesn't really look like um, like we're open or anything like that. But I always say, you know, if you're um, no secret password though, right? Not yet. No. Yeah, okay. it, one of the things. So we're doing a little expansion. We're actually building uh, an area that will be more space for us and for private events and things like that. And also we're going to do um, private wine lockers. So you know, people can oh, nice. store wine here. We'll have all the temperature control and all that kind of stuff. If it gets to the point where um, we have more traffic in here than than I kind of want, and it's not to be exclusive or like pretentious or anything. We will do a password just to keep it where um, the people that you know are kind of seeking us out will have access to it. So we put on Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. and then add a little intrigue to it, you know, just you got to know a password to get in, and um, it'll be something wine themed. We've done a few of them, like during South by Southwest, you know, I had had a couple of passwords to do it. I've got the speakeasy style sliding window, yeah, and that kind of stuff, but. But right now, it's, you know, come in. We do take reservations of, like, bigger groups and stuff. I have them give cool. me a call, let me know. But other than that. And there's, there's, a, there's a nightclub here in Austin uh, that will 
occasionally on Twitter give a password out for free cover. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so uh, yeah. I don't ever get to really go see them. They're not open tonight. They told me they weren't open. They're not normally open on Mondays. Every once in a while they are, but yeah. they're not open. They said, well, we'll be over somewhere else maybe. I'm like, well, whatever. We'll figure out. I'm spending the night, so yeah. I'm going to have dinner. We're going to have some... Uh, we're gonna go out and do some some wine stuff with some friends, and I don't have to be back to San Antonio till whenever I feel like tomorrow. Yeah, man, that's perfect. It, yeah, that's, that's like I said. Anytime I get an excuse to come up here, yeah, uh, especially in a business thing these yeah. days. Yeah, man. If you're especially like if you want to eat and drink, there's a lot to do. There's it's fun. And I try to make sure I stay downtown, yeah, so I can walk to wherever I gotta walk sure. to. Sure. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't. You know, long term viewers of the show know that I, I've had my I've had my 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 year hiatus. I don't ever want to have that again. <laughs> I don't ever want to have a year hiatus because because I, I had one too many and uh, uh, so I, I do try to be very very careful when I when I do go out. So if I if I if we come to Austin, it's kind of like expected. You're gonna you're gonna have fun. So if I can yeah. stay downtown, yeah. I can walk or cab it easily. That's all I want. Or pedicab. Those pedicabs are all the yeah places, right. So yeah man. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we're gonna wrap things up. And uh, also, the, I can tell the lights are starting to dim a little bit, which means they they, they lasted pretty good. Uh, I can't see the individual LEDs. That's why I looked. You about probably twenty minutes ago. I started looking at the lights. If I can't see the individual LEDs, they're still bright they're enough. Doing okay. Yeah. They're doing okay. I'm not in danger of the battery dying on me quickly. But um, we're gonna wrap things up. Um, as always, I just want to, first of all, I want to thank you for hey, inviting me up here. It's, it's, I'm it's, glad you came up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was good to chat. You know, we, we've, we've, we've kind of crossed paths over the past couple of years at Texom yeah. and stuff like that. But this has been great to come up and really just yeah. hang out for a little bit and get to know each other better. Got to see the lunch. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, as always, I really appreciate everyone stopping by. Um, uh, I'll have all the information for Red Room Lounge and everything for you um, down below. So, stop by the website. Click links below for everything. Friend me up. Friend me up up here. Hit the donate button, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.